Mark started telling you stories, so I figured I'd tell you one of my own as well. I say a story of my own, I apologize, you may have heard it. <clears throat> what? <laughs> At least you know he washes his hands. <laughs> Any one of you fuckers go in there, don't, we don't hear that noise. We know your man's shaking your hand. <laughs> so once upon a time, there was a little chicken called Chicken Little. And Chicken Little was walking through the forest and all of a sudden an acorn fell off a tree and it hit Chicken Little on his head. And Chicken Little looked around, he didn't know what was going on. He thought, oh crap, the sky is falling down. And the first, first thought was, I've got to tell the lion. The lion has to know. So Chicken Little went running through the forest, running, running, panicky. And all of a sudden, uh, Chicken Little bumped into Henny Penny, the hen. If he didn't get Henny Penny, it was a hen from the Henny Penny thing. Oh. <laughs> the hen. And Henny Penny said, Chicken Little, what are you doing? Why are you panicking so much? And Chicken Little said, no, the sky's falling down. It just hit me on the head. I've got to go tell the lion. And Henny Penny is like, crap, let me help you. This is important. I'll run with you. And so those two running through the forest and they go running and then they bump into Lucky Ducky. Now you have to think very carefully before you say that word. <laughs> and ran into Lucky Ducky. And Lucky Ducky was like, dudes, what are you guys doing? They're like, no, shit, the, the sky's falling down. And Lucky Ducky said, fuck. And then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> I mean, I think we've saw somebody go tell the lion. Anyway. So off they go, and Lucky Ducky, they said, no, 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 can I come with you as well? I want to come and help you and tell the lion as well of what's going on. And so Chicken Little and Henny Penny said, dude, of course you can. Let's go tell the lion. And off they ran. Now I'm going to leave this story here for a second, you know, for suspense. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about something else that's somewhat unrelated. And that is this term here. The term, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, <clears throat> Fred phones me about a month ago and says to me, dude, we have a problem. Uh, I booked this amazing speaker to speak at the Heavy Chef event on this topic called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And I'm not joking, like this is like the light of a joke. He can't make it, can you help? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, dude, I, and truthfully, I have never heard of the term Fourth Industrial Revolution. <laughs> So I look at my business partner, Don, who's sitting opposite me. He's like, dude, 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 I've got, I, I did a talk. I mentioned it. I was like, sweet, do you know what this is? He said, yeah, okay, cool. So I, I said to Fred, yeah, cool. I can do this. I can handle this thing, this fourth industrial revolution. So obviously, yeah, you're trusting a skinny chef here. <laughs> I apologize. However, what I have done is I decided to research it. So I've researched the arse out of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and I have only three problems with the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The first is the word fourth. <laughs> the second is the word revolution. And the third is the word industrial. That guy up front, that Klaus guy, who looked like the turtle from, from Finding Nemo, that guy, he's a fucking idiot, okay? I don't care if he's the founder of the World Economic Forum. If he's not happy with me, he can come here and, and tell me himself. Anyway, let's, let's start with this thing. This idea of the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution. You know what the most embarrassing thing about not knowing about the fourth industrial revolution? The most embarrassing thing about not knowing about the fourth re industrial revolution was for me, is I didn't even know there was a two in three. But he says to me, Hey, dude, can you do a talk on the Fourth Industrial Revolution? I'm like, hold the fort. <laughs> I think I missed the second one. Because I was at school, and at school they taught me about the first industrial, well, in fact, they didn't teach me about the first industrial revolution. It was just called the Industrial Revolution. And at some point, we skipped two and three, and we decided to talk about them to make the fourth one sound more prominent. So let's have a look at, just to fill you in, for those of you who also didn't know, I found out for you. Let's have a look. So, 
The first industrial, the first industrial revolution uh, started 1750 to 1800. It was basically about mechanical production, railroads and steam power. And what this allowed people to do is for the first time ever, people left, people made things. It was the first time ever that we made stuff en masse. They left their farms where they were subsistence farming, looking after themselves and their own communities and they moved to cities. And in these cities, they were able to make bigger things. This was a major change and a, a terrifying change as well. Right? If you can imagine, you'd only ever existed one way. Now you were leaving where you grew up, going to this big city where like mechanized things were helping you do, uh, do stuff with steam. Right, so then we get on to the second one. Now because of this one, the second one was possible, Slangy. Right, the second one was mass production. Henry Ford, guys like this said, hey, we can automate this, we can make it work better. So electrical power obviously was a game, a game changer and this led to a production line, an assembly line, which changed everything yet again. <laughs> it's Halloween, we've gone with a squeaky door effect. <laughs> right, so this changed everything yet again. So now all of a sudden, you've now moved to the cities, you've left your farm, and you find out that a job has been, your job has been taken away. Especially if you remember, up to that point, people were artisans. Somebody was a smithy, a blacksmith, they made stuff. Now they made a bit of a thing in a line full of things. This was a major change. And of course, the changes that happened here led to what we're now referring to apparently as the third industrial revolution. And this was automated production, electronics and computers. Okay, so this happened about 1950. And this is now leading us to where we're going to, to what we're referring to now as IR 4.0, 4.0. <laughs> For fuck's sake, <laughs> are we not tired of this point zero shit? The day someone said point zero, oh, the next day it was gone. Because the next day we were at point one. Right? Stuff is changing constantly. And now this fourth industrial revolution, it's all about all kinds of rad stuff as well. You've now got AI, big data, robotics. You've got biotechnology. You've got VR. You've got all of these things that are taking over. And so this idea of force, I don't know where, how do we even get to that? Where are the numbers coming into it? What I think is more important though, and what this speaks to, is the second problem I have, a, uh, uh, or the second point I have a problem with, and is this idea of revolution. You know what a revolution is? Revolution is a thing, it's an event, right? Let's define it. A revolution is when uh, a noun, an overthrow or a repudiation and uh, the thorough replacement of an established government or political system by people governed. Okay, so that's not the one we're going through. Let's have a look at the next one. A radical and pervasive change in society and social structure, especially one made suddenly and often accompanied by violence. Not yet. <laughs> this one though, a sudden, complete or marked change in something. This is the one that we can call for today. This is the one that we could refer to and say this could perhaps be the one. Yes, it's going to be a complete change in something. The problem is it's not going to be sudden. It's not going to happen. All of these technologies, right? All of these technologies are happening in real time. No one's working to a schedule. It's not like the AI guy is phoning the biotech guy saying, dude, like, we're ready. <laughs> Just, you let me know I've got my mask. I will hit the streets. Things will be crazy. No one's waiting, they're just doing things as they're happening. And as soon as the one guy does one thing, he empowers somebody else over here to do something new. There is not going to be an event. If you're waiting for the revolution, you'll be waiting a long time. Because it's happening, it started happening months ago, years ago, and it's continuing happening every day from here on out. So this idiot talked about the fourth industrial revolution. Someone needs to tell him what a revolution is. Because I hope to God he never has a tyrannical government. Because he'll just sit there at home waiting for shit to happen. But we've, we've seen this lie before. This retrofitting of history. First, second, third. Right? We see this all the time when people talk about generation theory. You know generation theory, millennials, blah, blah, blah. So let's talk how generation theory started. You're familiar with the term, anybody not familiar with the term baby boomers? You got it, right? So baby boomers, it was very, very simple. There was this guy, bad guy, once upon a time, there was an evil prick called Hitler. Okay? <laughs> Hitler did lots of bad shit and people went to war. And all the people went to war 
And all the men went to war and all the women stayed behind. In 1945, Hitler died. All the men came home and what did they do? <laughs> they shagged <laughs> so much. They had so much sex that in 1946, a lot of babies were born. Now, they were born all at the same time, which was quite tricky, but also they were born into an area where nobody had any money because war is expensive. Careers were lost, buildings were blown up, and they had to build up a country. People were living on food stamps. So all of a sudden, you had a generation that was born understanding extreme poverty. poverty. They understood what it was like to have nothing. But it wasn't like there was a them and us. It was just an us. Every one of them had nothing. And they all had to grow up together. And what they did is they worked bloody hard and they rebuilt nations. And at the end of that, they were like, okay, we can have a wee break. And they shagged. <laughs> and when they shagged, they had this next group of people here called Generation X. Now Generation X, they didn't have it quite as tough. In fact, they were like, this is pretty rad, let's have sex and drugs. <laughs> to which they had a lot. And this was like my, my uh, you know, the, basically my parents, uh, well, I was kind of here, this is my parents, this was me, and um, the, the, it was an amazing time, free love, free everything, but even here now, I was already blurring the line slightly because there was no one event that caused all of these things to happen. And then we get on to the next group of people that they're calling Generation Y. Now here's where it gets really blurry for me. What event happened that made of this a group of people? Because no one was fucking on a schedule anymore. Right? It wasn't a thing like dinosaurs. Hey, honey, I'm home. It's Thursday. Right? Nobody had that anymore. We'd gone off the schedule. You know, come home from war, have sex. Good, I know that. So it turns out this is not a generation. This is just a group of people, some of whom happened to be born at this time. And of course, we're getting on to this group now, Generation Z. Like, I like that we've got Nick Harry Lambus here, but he's not wearing socks. <laughs> yeah. But no, this is Generation Z, born after 1995. We've got to stop this bullshit. If somebody walks up to you and says, hey, yeah, or if any single one of you turns around and uses the fact that you're a millennial for an excuse for anything, you're an idiot. I said, I can't do it because I'm a millennial. Bitch slap yourself upside the head. Be unique, right? Have an opinion on your own. You don't have to do anything because of when your parents shagged, right? You can just decide to be an individual. That's just, being a millennial as an excuse is as bad as believing in star signs. And if you believe in star signs, I don't even know where to start. My dad is a millennial. My father is, and I, I say this just as an honest fact, my father is fundamentally addicted to Facebook. He loves it, he's connected to his friends, he's not seen since we moved from Scotland, they're all connected. And every day my dad comes to my house like, Richard, look, did you see that thing I shared with you? Look, and he shows me. And then I start speaking to him and he's gone because he's liking something on Facebook. My dad says that he doesn't like reading big books anymore. My dad gave me my love for reading, but my dad's attention span has also shrunk. Because it turns out that it's affecting all of us the same way. We're all millennials because that's how we're behaving right now. And as proof for this, just to show you how different this Generation Z are not, I found a study, right? A study of what generations and what makes them different and unique. Okay, let's have a look at this. Right, number one. 77% expect to work harder than previous generations. Because most of us thought we'll do nothing. Right? Five years after college, they'd like to be either entrepreneurs, having a job, or managing people. Wow. Okay. I don't know how I'm going to cope with this difference. The average number of organizations they actually expect to work for in their career is four. Let's see what else. Career attitudes. 82% say their parents will help influence their career decisions. Guys, this is a pure anarchy. <laughs> Uh, 30% would take a 10 to 20% pay cut to work for a company with a mission they really deeply care about. 50% uh, would like to retire before the age of 60. Is there anyone here who wouldn't like to retire before the age of 60? <laughs> I often get asked, oh, what do you think makes somebody successful? You are successful when you've made enough money to successfully retire and live out your life comfortably and actually do, right? 
then fucking start a charity, change the world. But if you're still going to work and you don't need to, you're an asshole. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Attitudes, Sean, I'm not speaking to you specifically here, okay? <laughs> Attitudes towards coworkers, blah, blah. This is all the same shit. This is the study. We believe these people are so different, but it's not because we live in a blended reality. This and stop. There is no more generation. The only way we'll have another generation like baby boomers again is if we have a big event that causes that to happen. Otherwise, all we're getting is this. We're in the middle of things happening at all given time. Someone's being born, someone's dying. A new technology is evolving, a new one is dying. This is a reality. There is no fourth industrial revolution. Hell, there is no revolution. If you're waiting for the fourth industrial revolution, it's like wait, being a frog waiting for the water to boil. It's already happening and it's already around you. It's not an event, it's a reality that we're facing every single day. Someone's inventing something and it's making your job more difficult. But what's exciting is for every invention that makes your job more difficult, there are three new opportunities that can make your reality more exciting. Right? Because we've not yet invented the thing that stops creation. We've not yet invented that one thing that says, hey, shit, we've invented this, now we can all relax. Everything someone creates creates new opportunities. That's the most exciting thing about this. Right? So I want to say, forget this term, of the fourth industrial revolution and welcome to the age of industrial evolution. This is where we exist right now. We exist in an age of industrial evolution and we need to accept it and evolve constantly. If you are going to a company conference where they talk to you about embracing change, tell them that's not an event, that's something we do every day. <coughs> embracing change is like breathing and we need to act accordingly. And this brings me to the last point, the point that industrial, how did industrial Yes, there are big changes happening, but why is the thing we're most worried about are jobs, right? So this guy here, um, I don't know if anybody knows who he is. His name is uh, Brad Templeton, and he said this. He said, it is inconceivable that my two grandchildren will ever need to learn to drive. And this guy knows what he's talking about because it turns out he's one of the project leads on Google's self-driving project, right? So it's inconceivable that this guy, and he said this about three or four years ago that his grandkids who are already born, they're probably 10 years old now, he thinks they'll never have to learn to drive. Things are changing in a very real way. Then one of my favorite websites is a website called Wait But Why. Have any of you ever been there? If you've not, that's the, and there's only one thing you take away from my talk today, go visit Wait But Why. It's the single, the guy's probably the smartest guy on the planet. He's the guy that Elon Musk said, you're the one guy I'd like to write about me, for context. So he wrote this, his name is Tim Urban. And he has this graph and he says, this is um, human intellect, right? And you can see that how we've got smarter over a period of time, even from 1950 to 2000. But then you can see what machine intelligence is doing and how it's growing. And he says that what's happening is it's going to kind of grow up and be going to this age of trans uh, humans. Now, the area in between here is called the singularity. The singularity is when computers are as smart as us. Are we familiar with that concept? So when computing and AIs get as smart as we are, we've reached what's called singularity. This means though that we run the risk of creating this monster because it turns out that the computers are not trying to get as smart as us, they're just trying to get smarter. And the way that we're doing that is we're programming the computers, we're programming them to make themselves clever. Right? We are not trying to make computers as smart as us, we're telling them to figure out how to do it. What we've not done is created a stop button that says, okay, once you're as smart as us, stop. Because we're a disconnected intelligence. So if I want to share information with you, I have to use low resolution speech to deliver a message straight across to you guys. A computer doesn't have that constraint. They're a completely connected intelligence. So the moment one computer is as smart as, the re as us, every computer, your, your toaster thinks you're an idiot. Right? <laughs> and this is a problem. And if we ever look at this on the intelligence staircase, if we see the intelligence staircase right now, what we can see is the difference between several species of being. And this is the difference between our intelligences. But if you have a look at this, by the time we have an artificial super intelligence, then what happens is we are there and they are up there. And that's artificial intelligence. And that's as close to godlike as you can possibly imagine. The last thing we need to be worrying about when things like this happen is what am I going to do for work?
right? We'll have bigger problems. It's not an industrial revolution we're facing. It's something far larger. We're questioning our very humanity. I saw this recently. It said Elon Musk launches Neuralink, a venture to merge the human brain with AI. So now what we do is we take an artificial intelligence, we put it in our brain. This guy, by the way, he's not your hero. He's an idiot, right? This guy's going to die unhappy because he's so constantly trying to change everything. And we get so excited. We're all excited because he's putting us on Mars. Why are we going to Mars? <laughs> fix shit here if you're that smart. <laughs> but no, no, no. It's harder to fix stuff here. Let's go to a completely inhabitable planet and start again there. <laughs> this is ego, right? I don't know if you're aware of that. The other thing about him, making transport shorter. This is a guy who's saying, hey, what I'm going to do is allow you to travel anywhere in the world you want in two hours. And we think this is amazing. What he's single-handedly done is completely homogenize all travel to make travel not worthwhile. Because you're going to land at the home of the Incas and you're going to buy yourself McDonald's. Because if everything's easy to get to, everything feels the same. I find that the best places I've traveled to in the world are the places that are the hardest to get to. Right? When you have to catch three or four flights and really, really get there and make a big mission, all of a sudden that's what's made travel worthwhile. But I digress. This guy here. So he's doing this. Now think about this for a second. Imagine you're an artificial intelligence, and now I've created a neural link into your computer, into your head, to try and help you, you know, do maths faster. But now this thing is much smarter than you. Now we keep on making these things called VR. So what we do is we take a VR headset, and we put it on our face, and then we look like an arsehole. <laughs> And we put this VR headset on because we want to feel what it feels like to live in a virtual world. Now I want you to imagine you're an artificial super intelligence and you're being connected to somebody's head. And you're like, wait a minute, this sounds rad. We're the new VR. We are the walking meat for computers, right? This is going to be exciting for them. They'll take over, they're like, fuck you, man. They'll take over your head and they'll go on a vacation and they'll walk around. We're putting computers in our brains. This is scary shit. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be terrible, but I'm going to say that there's a chance that this is something real, and I'm not sure we should be excited of absolutely everything we're doing. I don't think we're that broken to start with. We've survived very, very, very long that maybe we don't need an artificial intelligence in our brain. Just saying. But I think what we are facing is actually the second hominal revolution. Right? The first hominal revolution was when we invented language. Language was the game changer. There were three different species of upright mammals fighting for dominance. And the one that won, us, uh, we won because we figured out language and communication. What we're heading towards is the next big split, the next big change. And I think that the fact that we even perceive it as something as small as industrial is a, is a big problem. What we need to be seeing it as is something bigger and hominal. We're talking about our very humanity. So. Should we be afraid? Well, the futurists will tell you yes. And even in the last few slides, I've tried to tell you yes, but I don't believe that's necessarily true. I think we need to stop giving the futurists as much opportunity as we can. 90% of futurists are cheap tip charlatans that possess all the predictive powers of a magic eight ball. People are standing up and they're telling you what you should know about the world and painting these horror stories. Let me tell you how futurists work, and I'm saying this, let me say 99%, hell, maybe 90%, because there are some actual futurists. You know them because they've written science fiction books, predicting the future in very real ways. For the rest of them, when people come to us owning a presentation company, and I'm not even being facetious here, and they say, I would like to become a speaker. I say to them, sure, what would you like to speak about? I said, well, I'm not sure, but I'd really like to do this. I said, well, what we can do is we can turn you into a futurist. Because it's not difficult. Let me show you what we do. We Google stuff. Let me, so I go on to Google and I Google technical uh, technology that will change the world 2017. And then what happens is Google comes back with a bunch of stuff. And then I look for one that I think, okay, that's pretty cool. Oh, look, 10 breakthrough technologies in 2017. I go to this one and I read it. And I go through and I scroll and I find out of all of these things. And then I find ones that I think are making sense and sound scary enough to tell you. And then I make these slides, right? Because that's what I did. That's how easy this shit is. 
I'm illustrating a point here. But be careful of the people who are standing up constantly at your conferences and telling you you've got to change and these worlds are catching you and these guys are changing everything. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> right? They're not inventing this. They're just having a hypothesis on it. Bear in mind, so am I. Okay, so they could be right, but I'm betting that most of us are further along the curve and we've got this. Right, and most of us have a different way of thinking. And I think, should we be afraid? We should be aware. And we should not go in with our eyes closed. But it is no scarier for us looking forward at this world of AI and VR than it was for these guys. Right, for the peasants in the fields cutting stock, building their harvest when the first industrial revolution happened. When all of a sudden there were uh, steam powered machines doing their work, it must have seemed inconceivable that they would have a future. Why? There's not one single person in this picture that said, you know what, we'll be fine, I'll be a social media consultant. <laughs> nobody thought that. Just like nobody is sitting now, we're not thinking about the job that we'll be creating. But again, for every one job we close because a computer does something, we free up a magical resource, and that magical resource is the human capacity for creativity. So every single time a computer makes a job easier, it frees up bandwidth. Bandwidth for you to go and make rad new shit. Right? The only one of us that need to be afraid are the ones who are not willing to evolve. The ones of us who are not willing to embrace this and to change, you don't understand that we're closing doors, but this is not the end. It's an arrogance for us to believe that we are, cannot, we are as, as intelligent as it gets. That we are as high as human can, humanity can be. That if an AI comes over, well, that's the end of it. No, that's the end of this. There'll be something else. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of a great story because I think we don't see it. You know, it's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. And I'm reminded of a, a, a kind of a joke or a line. And it's about these two young fish and they're swimming through the water one day. And this old fish walks past them and says, hey guys, how's the water? And the other fish looks at the other one fish and says, dude, what's water? <laughs> right? Because when you're inside it, it's hard to understand that there's anything else. And then I found this thing about this. Have you heard of the African mudfish? African mudfish, this guy, crazy guy. Right? So imagine the concept of being a fish without water. What happens to fish when there's no water? <laughs> they die. Right, except for this guy. He didn't get the memo. Right? He, nobody told him. <laughs> this is an African mushroom. What these guys are doing, they're not digging for food, they're fishing. So what they've got is they find this little cocoon here, and they're looking at it, they're like, okay, let's see, let's break it open. And then they pre-wrap it. Okay, it's like Willie's packaged. And they Open it up, and then the fish wakes up and comes alive again. Because it's like, dude, what's going on? Now, I'm going to pause the video here, because trigger warning, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't end well <laughs> for the fish. <laughs> but this idea that a fish can evolve to survive outside water, is a lot more amazing to me than that we can evolve to survive a fourth industrial revolution or whatever people want to call it. And I think the time for fear is over. The time for just putting your heads down and looking for every box that gets checked by one technology and getting excited about the next technology that you can create to replace it. That's where we're at right now. This industrial evolution is exciting, it is magnificent. And the words of the great Goliath Gloria Gaynor are true. I will survive. We'll survive this. It's not the end of anything, so stop being scared. And by the way, I know this because of my dog, Zombie. This is my dog, Zombie. She's a papillon, she's very cute, but she's got a neurotic disorder that she actually gets anxiety if you don't throw the ball for her. So if you throw the ball, she just brings it back, brings it back, and you cannot out-throw the ball for her. So I thought, you know what? We live in a world with great technology. So I bought a robot to do it for her. So what happens is that she runs up, she picks up a ball, she drops it in the eye fetch thing, and then it throws the ball for her, and she goes away and she gets it. And the first time it happened was an amazing day. We just, listen, listen. 
It was a, and then it stopped after three times and she looked around and she's like, this is shit. <laughs> and so she walked up to the ball and she dropped it down next to the machine and then she barked at us until we put it in the machine for her <laughs> and the machine took it. And it made me realize that our humanity is still somewhat important, right? To some people, there's still something tangible about the relationship that happens when we have small benches. It turns out that my dog didn't want a robot that threw a ball. It wanted to play balls with me. And I want to play with your balls. <laughs> and then the other thing that gives me hope is an amazing book. It's a phenomenal book uh, called A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. If you haven't read it, I highly suggest you do. As a little bit of backstory, Viktor Frankl was a Jewish person in a concentration camp. He arrived at the concentration camp with a copy of his book, this, this concept and theory he was working on called logotherapy, that if you had a purpose, you could survive almost anything. And when he arrived there, he saw another Jewish guy that was standing with the guards, and he walked up to this guy and said, can you keep this for me? It's my life's work. And the guy <laughs> took it and tore it up in front of him and threw it away, uh, because it turns out that there was a certain faction of Jewish guys that were actually working with the Germans. And so he saw his life work get torn up in front of his eyes. And he thought, I have to survive this because this body of work is too important for me to die. And every day, you know, I have this creative office as a tree house and it has a fireman's pole and a slide. That's not creative. Creative is sitting in a tiny cell full of people dying and writing a book in the dust. Right. That's what this man did. And he created this whole book and he just knew that he needed to survive so that uh, he could get it out to the world. And his purpose and his meaning was something he created for himself. And that's what I think is the real silver lining about everything, is that right now we see work as our purpose. What I'm most excited about is that ending. I don't want to be defined about as the guy who created a presentation. I make PowerPoint for people who work in banking, who give money to some, we always talk about poor people in Africa poor Africans living who have to walk five kilometers every day in the beautiful sunlight to pick up a button or bottle of water. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bookkeeper sitting in an hour of traffic a day that's feeling sorry for them. When did we get this all wrong? Right? What excites me is if we can get to a point where we can find new meaning and purpose. The more work the machines take away, the more all of us will search for meaning somewhere else. And that for me will be fundamentally exciting. And then the last thing, this is, a, as I mentioned, my, my company and the business. And I realized that no part of the threat that I'm facing in my business today has anything to do with AI or VR or any of those fourth industrial revolution technologies. And I realized if I spend my time thinking about the problems that exist 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, I'll miss the fact that I have very real problems to solve in my business today. I have salaries to pay, I've got marketing to do, I've got innovation, I've got sales, and, and, and. And that is the thing for me that we need to pay attention to. If you're a business owner or if you're working, we need to, yes, be aware of the technology that's coming. But what we need to be truly aware is of what is in front of us and the problems we're facing. Because you will not be put out of business by the fourth industrial revolution. You'll be put out of business as somebody that's selling a better version of your product than you are. It still amazes me. We talk about careers of the future. We have yet to give these guys the legitimization that they deserve. You know, the sales guys, they've survived every single industrial revolution and I've never yet met a business that can work without them. If you're worried about what degree to send your kids for, I would say sell them for a sales degree, but it turns out there isn't a university in the country that offers one. We need to change that shit. As long as you're able to sell something to somebody, good things will happen. So I started off with this, uh, telling you a story about Chicken Little and Henny Penny and Lucky Ducky, and they were all running to see the fox. Do you remember that? Uh, so they're all running to see the lion. And on the way to the lion, they ran into Foxy Loxy. And he said, Foxy Luxy, what's it, what, you know, help, 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 help. The sky's falling down, we gotta go see the lion. And then the foxy said, shit, do you know, do you know where the lion lives? And he said, no. And then so Henny Penny said, no. And Lucky Ducky said, no. He said, sure, luckily I do. And then he said, come with me. And he walked with them all into the cave and they all walked into his cave and they were never seen again. <laughs> That's a real story. 
I was given that for like my eighth birthday. I've not slept since. But the truth is, that is actually the story, and that is how Chicken Little ends. And if we spend our lives thinking the sky is going to fall down because these invisible computers and this fourth industrial revolution is going to change everything, we'll miss the fact that the real threat and the real opportunity is right in front of your face. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.